Mole End, one has to admit, wasn't the most fashionable of residences. After all, Mole was not rich like Toad or artistic like Rat. He was not of ancient lineage like Badger. But Mole had built Mole End himself to suit his own modest tastes, and he was fond of it, with its Gothic windows, its bell chain, and its lamp. Anyone who came to visit Mole always felt welcome, and people did come. Rat, if he could be enticed away from his beloved river. Toad, to play skittles. And even Badger would share a glass of home-brewed ale. But Mole never expected visitors from the bigger world outside. At least, not until a letter arrived one morning. Oh my! Oh my! He exclaimed as he read it on his doorstep. I must tell Ratty! As he neared the riverside house, it became obvious that Ratty was not alone. Toad's voice rang clear in the bright morning air, and Toad was at his most bumptious. Wealth has its duties as well as its privileges, he was saying. One endeavours to elevate the tone. Ratty could stand this no more and endeavoured to bring Toad down to earth. Care for a cup of tea, Toad? Such tactics could not stop Toad. He merely incorporated the suggestion in his grandiose thoughts. Tea? Oh, why not, dear Rat? <laughs> Soon it will be caviar, champagne, but now... Ratty? Mole called as he neared the front door, providing the diversion the Rat needed. Oh, there's Mole, he remarked to Toad. Oh, Mole. <laughs> Yes, excellent fellow, Mole, Toad replied magnanimously, though he then rather spoiled the effect by adding... In each way. Mole could scarcely contain his excitement as Ratty opened the door to him. <laughs> Hello, Ratty. Toad, I'm glad you're here. Such news, Ratty. Come in, old fellow. Ratty welcomed his friend warmly. Care for a cup of tea? <laughs> yes, please. I didn't have any breakfast. You see, I got this letter. Mention of letters reminded Toad what he had been talking about. A mole, just in time to hear my news. I have some news too, Toadie. You, you see, I had this letter. Ah, yes, don't get many of those, Mole, I dare say. Now, my correspondence extends throughout the crowned heads of Europe. The other two animals were determined not to give Toad the attention he sought. Here's your tea, Mole, said Rat. Uh, th thank you, Ratty. Yes, I've, I've had a letter from my cousin. And oh, Ratty, he's, he's coming to stay with me. I say, Mo, that'll be jolly for you, said the Rat, genuinely pleased at his friend's excitement. Toad was less impressed. Yes, yes, very interesting, he said impatiently. But, Mo, you haven't heard my news yet. A sugar Toad. What? Oh, yes. The diversion just gave Rat time to inquire... What sort of chap is your cousin, Mo? Well, well, I've never actually met him, but I, I dare say he likes the same sort of things as I do. R Ratty, I, I thought perhaps you'd show my cousin the river. We, we might even have a picnic. And I, I, I'm sure he'd like to visit Toad Hall. Toad seized this opening, gulped down his tea, and began... Dear Mole, any relative of yours, however humble, must always be welcome. But just now, a rather important social event is about to occur. I am giving a literary soiree, and I have just heard that the distinguished poet Oberon Mole has promised to attend. Oh, yes, said Mole, matter-of-factly. That's my cousin. Hmm? Toad's mouth dropped. Impossible. Even Ratty looked startled. Oberon Mole is your cousin, Molly? No, 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 Ratty, of course not! Toad burst out. Oberon Mole is a famous literary figure. Mole's cousin is someone quite different. I dare say he is, Toady, but his name is Oberon. I'm sorry to say that even Rat still doubted Mole a little, and he inquired, I say, Mole, are you sure? In reply, Mole quietly produced the letter. Rat perused it and said simply, That's quite right. So it is. He looked sternly at Toad, who insisted, But he's a famous literary figure. 
I was quite astonished when he agreed to come to our little soiree. Naturally, I suggested that he should stay at Toad Hall. I mean, he can't possibly stay at Mole End. Mole looked despondent. Oh, well, what rot, Toad? Rat retorted. Of course he can. Mole smiled, relieved. Ratty continued. Mole End is a very jolly little place. Just needs furbishing up a trifle. No difficulty with that, eh, Moley? At this, Mole looked a little uneasy, but he nodded. And so, a day or two later, the two friends came to give Mole a hand. There was plenty to do, as Toad and Rat saw the task. For instance, the garden roller needed to be hidden. A pot of chrysanthemums might do the trick, Ratty reckoned. That's right, Toad. Put it down there, he directed. But I, I use the garden roller every day, Mole objected. R -r Rabbits will come in and make footprints, and I like the place to be kept tidy. But you don't want to look as if you do it yourself, Mole, Toad replied. Now why not hire a weasel for an hour or so every day to lean on it? That's what my gardeners do at Toad Hall. Rat kept finding things which he considered unfitting for the important guest. And we really ought to hide the skittles. Oh, yes, Toad agreed, conveniently forgetting how much he enjoyed his games on Mole's front path. Not the thing at all for a gentleman's house. We might borrow one of Badger's cricket bats, prop it up outside the front door, continued Rat. When they went to collect the bat, Badger had a few other suggestions. Nothing like a Latin quotation or two, my young friend, he suggested. When occasion arises, just take one of these books negligently out of your bookshelves. When they had staggered back to Mole End with Badger's books, Rat transferred his attention to the inside of the house. We really ought to do something about this furniture, he remarked. So, in due course, some of Toad's choicest pieces arrived. Placid though he was, Mole was beginning to feel threatened and he plucked up the courage to object. I, I, I'm not sure that um, quite fits with the rest of my furniture, he said cautiously. It didn't occur to Toad why Mole might have doubts. I should hope not, Mole, he replied devastatingly. That's Chippendale, that is. The rat, meantime, placed the candelabra on the table. You'll dine at home, Mole, the first evening, I dare say. The prospect horrified Mole. Dine? He quavered. Toad, still quite insensitive to Mole's feelings, suspected it was the food that was the problem. Don't worry, Mole, he said. I'll send the food around. There'll be caviar, Chateaubriand, champagne. Y yes, but... Mole tried to stem the flow of suggestions. And of course, you'll change for dinner, Rat said in a tone which implied that there could be no doubt about it. Even he had not realised Mole's true concern, and continued, when he received no immediate reply, Ah, no dinner jacket, I dare say. Toad? Certainly, my dear fellow, only too happy to oblige. Previous Michaelmas, Toad had written a little song for his entertainment at Toad Hall. You've got to have style, it was called, and it exactly summed up what the three friends were trying to say to Mole. Toad tentatively tried the first line, and the others joined in. You've got to have a little bit of style. If you leave it all to us, you'll be really quite beguiling. Casually quote a Greek or Latin phrase. Or something from the tragic plays of Shakespeare. You've, You've got, got to have, have a little, little bit of style. You've got to have a little bit of style. And that's the thing that always knocks them in the aisle. Just be scintillating, debonair and chic. And I can give you hints on half the din of speaking. Then you'll have a little bit of style. You've got to have a little bit of style. 
If one is not too gifted, it's terribly worthwhile to know about antiques and objets d'art. And maybe drop in little gems like Eaton and Harris. Show, Show you've you got, got a little, little bit of style. <laughs> Got a little bit of style. You've got to have a little bit of style. It'll help you through those really rather terribly vile occasions. Where everyone's acting affable and suave. And polishing off the shampoos and the grave by the magnum. Then you need a little bit of style. You've got to have a little bit of style. Society people stand up a man Cause they're fashionable, elegant and astute Though a slightly pinching waist is causing acute discomfort You've, you've got, got to have a little bit of style You've got to have a little bit of You've got to have a little bit of Style An hour later, Mole was looking at a reflection of himself Which he scarcely recognised his three friends were still making encouraging remarks, although Rat implied that it could have fitted better. Splendid, Moly. Splendid, he said. Mm. If only we had time to get it to my tailor, Toad remarked. Mole glanced at himself once again in the mirror, and he could finally contain himself no longer. No, he said defiantly. Rat, Toad and Badger looked at each other astonished. No, they echoed. No, Mole repeated. If he, if, if he won't take me as I am, he can... Losing his temper was so foreign to Mole's nature that he was stuck for words. And he had to finish a little lamely. He can go away! It was therefore in his neat but homely clothes that Mole welcomed an impeccably dressed cousin on the following day. So this is Mole End, Oberon said as he crossed the threshold. After all his friends had tried to do, Mole assumed Oberon would be critical of his humble surroundings. So his tone was defiant when he replied, Yes, it is. His suspicions were confirmed when Oberon asked, Should I dress for dinner? So he said, no, and I don't usually have dinner, just high tea. Ah, said Oberon, non-committally. Mole had a touch of desperation in his voice as he continued, I thought we might have muffins and poached eggs. So he was astonished when Oberon replied, Just what I fancy. Really? Mole perked up. And just the two of us? Even now, unsure of his cousin's true wishes, Mole replied tentatively, Yes. His fears were finally dispelled when Oberon replied, Splendid! If you only knew how tired I am of high society and literary figures and all that stuff. As they sat, feet up beside the fire later that evening, Oberon continued, I don't mean to do anything while I'm here except to enjoy a little simple comfort and some family gossip. Did you know about Uncle Ethelbert? The next morning, Oberon and Mole played Skittles. Oh, I've always wanted to play Skittles, enthused the delighted Oberon, and most refreshing. What a treat! When Mole served some home-brewed beer. We don't really have to go to that literary soiree tomorrow, do we? He asked. Mole, warm though he was by this turn in events, felt loyal to his friend. Toad will be so disappointed if you don't. I, I think you ought to go. Oh, very well. Just to please you. So the next evening, Toad, in his grandest evening dress, came to collect his honoured guest. 
and they returned to Toad Hall in Oberon's chauffeur-driven roles, even if it caused Toad some discomfort to note that the chauffeur was another Toad. Arrived at the hall, Toad received his comeuppance in full measure. What a charming little place you have here, Oberon remarked. It quite reminds me of the summer house at Little Bending, the Duke of Pilling's place. Summer house? spluttered the outraged Toad. But Oberon continued, including Mole in an expensive gesture. You know my cousin, of course. When I received your very obliging invitation, I was going to refuse. Such a press of engagements. So fatiguing. But then I realised that it would give me the opportunity to visit Mole End and to get to know my cousin. I remember that my father always used to say that he was the best of the lot of us. Toad couldn't believe his ears. No! But Ratty responded, Quite right, so he is. And Badger said with his usual dignity, An honour and a privilege, sir, to welcome you here. Not least because you are related to our friend. Toad realised which way the wind was blowing. What? Uh, oh, um, yes, quite, quite so, Rat. Uh, absolutely, Badger. You took the very words out of my mouth. The soiree was a great success, and Oberon was captivated by his cousin's hospitality. When the time came to leave, Oberon was fulsome in his thanks. Dear cousin, I can't thank you enough. I feel a different mole. I hope I may come back again one day. Any time, of course, said the delighted mole. Perhaps next time, Ratty would take me on the river. I I'm sure he would. Goodbye, cousin Oberon. A few days later, the front doorbell jangled. It was Toad. Uh, hello, Mo. He beamed. Just wondered if you might care for, for a little game of Skittles. It had grown much colder. The few remaining flowers of a late autumn had a frail, uneasy look about them. Damp leaves, fallen from the hedgerows, hung from mist-glistening cobwebs and fluttered sluggishly in the browning grass. Badger, out for his morning constitutional, sniffed at the cooling air. He grunted approvingly, thinking of the winter months to come which he'd spend in the comfort of his fireside with his books and memories for company. He always followed the same path for these walks. He was in any case a creature of habit and tradition, but he also took pleasure in noticing the minute but relentless changes which marked the passage of the seasons. The first sharpness of frost, the first brown leaf, and in due course, the first bud the first visiting bird. By passing the same way each day, he could follow every nuance. This particular morning, however, his train of thought was sharply interrupted. A shrill voice, a young rabbit, Badger reckoned, was protesting. No, I won't. The answer was in a gruff and rough voice. 
Now, now, now. Mustn't contradict a grown-up. Especially not a grown-up weasel. Especially not me. It was the chief weasel. Ow! Came the rabbit's voice. Badger decided that the time had come to intervene. Hello? What's this? He growled, striding towards the clearing ahead, just in time to see the chief and a henchman towering over a schoolboy rabbit. Shall I give him the Chinese burn, Chief? Oh, please, sir, let me go. I'll be late for school. The Chief enjoyed the rabbit's evident desperation. Ah, sir is much better. His henchman agreed ingratiatingly. Very nice, very nice. And of course I'll let you go, said the Chief with sarcastic gentleness, ending more savagely. Just as soon as you hand over sixpence. Oh, but I have to give it to teacher. No marks for wrong answer. <laughs> you have to give it to me. The helpless rabbit tried to protest. Oh, but... You're on my path. It's sixpence to walk on my path. Quite right, quite right. The henchman approved. Oh, but, sir, me mum will be ever so cross if I give it to you. Your mum cross, said the chief, scornfully threatening. Have you ever seen me cross, have you? Why, you little... At this point, the chief looked as if he might actually hit the poor terrified rabbit. Badger interrupted in his sternest, most powerful voice. Now then, none of that... I exclaimed the astonished chief, and... Quack. ...his more perceptive number two. You! thundered the badger. Let that young fellow go. <sighs> Snarling in defeat, the henchman released his grip, and the rabbit, barely holding back tears, tried to explain to his benefactor. Oh, oh, Mr. Badger, sir! They were trying to take my school picnic money. I know, Sonny. I heard. The chief assumed an air of hurt innocence. Or oh, trying to take his... Oh, no, no, no. We was collecting for elderly weasels. Began the quicker-thinking ruffian. It's the annual flag. But Badger interrupted, demanding... Your pa, is it? Eh? Uh... Well, um, began the chief. Sixpence to walk on it, is it? <laughs> Just the chief's little joke, said the second weasel placatingly. Well, I'm on your path, Badger declared. Would you care to take a sixpence from me? Come and take a sixpence from me. Well, um... Come on. All right, Mr. Badger, hissed the chief, managing to make Mr. a positive insult by its insincerity. We can't stand here arguing with the likes of you. We, we've got things to attend to. Well, be off and attend to them before I attend to you. Coward that he was, the chief needed no more persuasion. <laughs> come on, come on, he urged his henchman. Uh, right, Chief. Come in. If the truth be told, that henchman had more courage, relatively speaking, than his chief. As he left, he raised his hand to shake it at the badger, as if to say, we'll be even with you for this. But at the last moment, he thought better of it and directed the gesture to the rabbit. You rotten sneak. With the weasels gone... The rabbit was full of gratitude. Oh, thank you, sir. That's all right, Sonny. But make sure that you go to school with the others in future. You see where being late has got you. Yes, sir, replied the rabbit smartly, hesitating because he was unsure how to take his leave of so distinguished a personage as the badger. Right. Off you go, the badger had to say and he watched indulgently as the rabbit scampered away. 
Unknown to Badger, the two weasels had not departed, but remained in the bushes nearby, muttering their discontent to each other. Now they were no longer in danger of their bluff being called. <coughs> Interfering old fool, said the chief. I'll pay him back for this. Mm, quite right, chief, quite right. Interfering with us in the lawful execution of our affairs. Uh, just what I say, chief, agreed the henchman, before he realised he didn't understand what it meant, and added... It... No, I don't really. What does it mean? It means, you idiot, that he's no right to stop us doing our job. Ah... Like taking sixpences from rabbits. The chief weasel had tougher things of more import on his mind, taking Toad Hall from Toad, for example, but decided that this was not the time to explain them, and merely muttered, Yes, well... Followed by a snap back to matters of the moment. Here, don't just stand there. Go and see if there's any more victims about. Oh, yes, chief. <laughs> right, chief replied the henchman as he scurried away into the undergrowth, leaving his chief to chunter to himself. Oh, useless object he is. If I'd have had seven or eight of the other lads with me, Mr. Badger, it might have been a different story. But I'll get even with you. You see if I... His scheming was interrupted by a sudden shout of pain. Now what? The chief exploded setting off to the place a little way down the path where his aide was hopping around on one leg, rubbing the other vigorously. What's the matter with you? Oh, 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 I've got myself a right clout on this thing. <laughs> Fancy leaving it there. Someone's bound to walk into it. Well, you idiot. That's what you're meant to do. The humans put it there. Eh? It's a trap, you fool. Another couple of inches and it would have had your leg. At me leg. In reply, the chief picked up a nearby stick and plunged it into the trap. Like that. The jaws sprang to like a clam. His henchman moaned. Oh. But the chief was thinking... A trap, eh? Suppose a badger was to stumble into one of those. Suppose a stupid interfering holier-than-thou badger got his leg in one of those. <laughs> Ooh, that'd quieten him down. He turned to his aide. Come on, come on, go and get the others. I've got a little job for them. An hour or so later, the trap was in position on the path but it could still be seen. More leaves, more leaves, you idiots. Anyone can see that. The chief bawled. And then... That's better. Now you two, and you two. Pointing to four of his men... Set it. Uh, set it, chief. Yeah, set it, open its jaws and set the catch. Uh, couldn't you do it, chief? No, you fool, I couldn't. To start with, it's a four-handed job. And supposing it should slip, eh? Where would you be without me, eh? Now go on, get on with it. His number two felt the time had come for action if he was to keep his job. After all, it wasn't him the chief had delegated. Well, go on, then. You heard what the chief said. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I knew it'd be us. All right, go on. Oh, one more. <laughs> <sighs> And before they could stand up and regain their breath, number two announced... Right. <laughs> Done it, Chief. Good. Good. Now leave it. Get back to the hideout. Uh, and now what happens, Chief? Now we leave it here waiting till tomorrow morning when you will be hidden here. When Badger takes his regular little stroll, when he sets his great interfering foot in my trap, you will come and tell me so. <laughs> and I will laugh and laugh. Now, hop it, the lot of you. Early 
the next morning, the henchman was awakened from his doze in the undergrowth by the sound of Badger humming gently to himself as he savoured the morning freshness. Oh, <laughs> it's him. <laughs> now for it, anticipated the weasel. But just as Badger neared the fork where the trap was placed, the young rabbit appeared, the same schoolboy whom the weasels had held up the day before. Oh, Mr. Badger, sir. Yeah. What? You again? I thought I told you not to go to school on your own. Uh, please, sir, it's Saturday. There isn't no school. <sighs> Any school. Badger corrected. The rabbit ignored the nicety. But please, will you come, Mr. Badger, sir? Whatever are you talking about? Yes, it's the hedgehog, sir. They say it's their fence, and my dad says, no, it's not, it's the rabbit. And they say, oh, yes, it is, and I think they might start hitting one another soon. And Dad said, go and get Mr. Badger, he'll sort it out. <laughs> so, will you, sir, please? Oh, dear me. The badger remarked. Fences and boundaries. <laughs> When property came in, peace went out, as my old father used to say. Oh, very well, very well. Lead the way, young fellow, my lad, lead the way. The weasel watched the events with dismay. Oh, he can't do that. He'll miss the blessed trap. I shan't I'll get it in the neck. The chief will go... He debated what to do next, working out where his quarry was likely to go. Now, he goes... And then he uh, comes back. Uh, rabbit's place. Badger's place is over there. So, uh... And he began, very gingerly so as not to spring it, to move the trap to a new location. He placed it on the path by which Badger, he reckoned, would have to return. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> the chief will give me promotion for this, said the weasel, congratulating himself when the trap was once more hidden by leaves. At the weasel's den, meanwhile, the chief was wondering what had happened. Where's that idiot? Why isn't he here? If he's mucked it up, if he's let that badger get away with it all, oh, I'll, I'll pickle him. Yeah. Right, Gov, murmured the obsequious weasels. Oh, shut up. Wait here. I'm going to sort this out. Arching angrily to the trap, the chief voiced his irritation. Oh, if he's dropped off, I'll skin him. I'll boil him. I'll pickle him. Oh, badger. I want you. His henchman, meanwhile, had just settled down out of sight in the undergrowth. Now, just wait. Just wait for Mr. Bloomin' Bunya. He heard a distant crackle on the path. Hello? Is it? Oh, no! No! Not the chief! <laughs> and the distraught aide leapt out from his hiding place. Chief! The fool! No, chief! No! Get down, you idiot! Snapped the chief. You! Ah! He stepped on the trap, which snapped shut with a metallic ring, instantly drowned by his anguished shout. An alarm cry is something special to wildwooders and to river folk. It can carry far beyond the range of most sounds and it triggers instant, rapt attention. It can silence the most animated conversation or cast a shadow over the most joyous celebration. No one need have heard it before to know its meaning. So all around, animals stopped to glance mutely but meaningfully at each other. Mothers clutched their children to them. Those by firesides huddled closer. Mole was in Ratty's house. they just settled down in front of the fire for a mid-morning cup of tea when they heard the cry. Oh, Ratty! exclaimed Mole. Oh, my dear fellow, 
I do believe that was... It sounded like someone... Trapped! Yes. Look here. We ought to see if we can... Help! Yes, agreed, the eager mole. It seemed as if it came from Badger's way, but that wasn't Badger. It sounded more like... His deductions were interrupted by a pounding on the door and a panicky shout from outside. Hello! Help! Is there anyone there? <laughs> Ratty went to the door and had hardly opened it before the chief's aide burst in. Here, Gov. It's the chief. He's been trapped. Ratty absorbed this with disdain. What? The chief weasel? That villain? Oh, but Ratty, said the warm-hearted Mole, as the weasel pleaded, oh, You've got to help him. He's hurt bad. The Rat sighed. Yes, you're right, Mole, of course. Weasel or Rabbit or one of us, it makes no difference. Not with a trap. All right, we're coming. Lead the way. The Chief had lost what little dignity and patience he normally had. Ratty and Mole struggled with the spring, whilst the Chief Weasel urged them on thanklessly. Come on, get me out! Rat replied calmly, Look here, I'm sorry, but we just can't manage it. The Chief, naturally assuming that others behaved as shabbily as he did, feared that his helpers might be refusing out of spite. Can't manage it? No, what? Ratty explained. We're just not strong enough. The mole, in this instant more practical, asked, where, where are all your friends? His suggestion was greeted with scorn. Friends? Friends? Do you mean that gang of idle layabouts that I have the misfortune to be the leader of? Y yes. Mole was taken aback at the chief's vituperation. But his attention was then distracted by... Oh! Ratty! Look! It's Badger! Thank heaven, it's just the chap we need. Badger! Badger! As he came towards the trap, Badger could not see who was caught for the throng around it. When he did, he was astonished. Yo! He's been trapped, Badger, and we can't get the jaws open, Rat explained. Badger pondered, then pronounced... You never will get them open. Too strong a spring. Uh, leave it. He was going to add, to me. But the chief, in the full flower of his panic, took leave it to be revenge. Leave it? Leave it, you miserable old fool! You don't care! You're a cold blight old hypocrite, I! I hate you, Badger! I hate you! In his passion, he failed to realise the implication of Badger's return with a sapling and continued his torrent of abuse until silenced by Badger. Now, oh, Ratty, Mole, directed Badger. Hold the trap steady while I get this between the teeth. As he began to prise the jaws apart, he remarked, oh, Hateful devices. <laughs> What kind of a creature would put that there? A dormouse supplied the answer, pointing at the henchman and saying, Please, sir, it was him. The henchman was not going to let that pass in public. Here, yeah, no, don't look at me. It wasn't my idea. He told me to... Indicating the chief, now free but hobbling. Ah, you blabbing idiot! I'll... But the crowd was not to hear the chief's plans for his aid, for Badger remarked in a wry, Presbyterian manner, Well, well, I might have known. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. By Jove, yes, added Rat. You've paid yourself out, Weasel. That leg is badly bruised. Isn't that nice for you and your clever friends? Snapped the ungrateful chief. No, it isn't. Rat retorted indignantly. You may be a weasel, you may be thoroughly evil, but you're still, alas, one of us. Uh, yeah. Come on. 
Rat continued. Let's get a splint on that leg. Mole found a T-shaped stick as a crutch. Rat finished his first aid, and the chief limped away, supported by his henchmen. Mole watched them go. Well, at least that's taught him a lesson. Perhaps he'll be a better creature now, he remarked naively. Well, you don't know your weasels, Mole, Ratty replied. In the distance, they could see the chief remonstrating violently with his aide. No, Ratty, agreed Badger. Weasels don't change. And neither, he added, looking ruefully at the trap. Do humans, I'm afraid. Oh, well. 